He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Let us worship God this morning and start by standing to sing the doxology. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you have given to us, Lord. Another day of life and breath, and you are the author of life, and you have given us this day. May we use this day to bring glory and honor and praise to your great name. We thank you for the ability to gather here together today, this Resurrection Sunday, free of persecution, and to be able to open up your word and learn from your word, what you have, would have for us to learn today. I ask that you would fill Dr. Lawson with your spirit as he comes up to exposit your text, that it would go forth with the power of your spirit and impact not just our minds, Lord, but ultimately our hearts and our wills this coming week. Lord, there are many needs in this congregation, and we know that you know all things. We know that you know all of these needs even more than we know we ask that you would meet those needs according to your timing and in your will and enable us to trust you amidst those trials and not lean on our own understanding. Lord, we thank you for Christ who we get to remember today, even more so with it being Easter Sunday. We thank you that he came and that he lived a perfect life and that he died and was crushed for our iniquities on that cross and that he was buried and that he did not stay buried, Lord, but he rose from the dead and that he was not there, but he was risen and that he ascended back into heaven and that he's coming back again one day. Lord, we thank you that Christ said that he is the resurrection and the life and that he who believes in him will live even if he dies. And Lord, I pray if anyone here is not a believer in Jesus Christ, if they do not know Jesus Christ, I pray that you would drop the scales off their eyes, enable them to see their sin and their separation from you, and come to see Christ as the mediator, as the only one who can reconcile them to you, to restore the relationship that's been broken by their sin that they would come to him the way, the truth, and the life and be saved. And Lord, for all those here that do know you, may they be encouraged to walk in a manner worthy of their calling through today's worship service. Lord, I pray for our brothers and sisters around the state, country, and world as they gather together this Resurrection Sunday to worship you. May they worship you in spirit and in truth. May the name of Christ be lifted up high this Lord's day. And may many people come to know you. And may many of your own be encouraged to walk more in a manner worthy of their calling. Lord, may everything that's done today be to the praise of the honor of the glory of your great name. In your son's name we pray, amen. You may be seated. And it looks like y'all have done a pretty good job of scooching over, but if there are any seats that are not taken, please move over a little bit so people can get one that are still coming in late and avoid the overflow lobby or Herb's house. If you are a visitor with us this morning, welcome. We are glad that you are here. We have a gift for you, a free MacArthur study Bible, and you can get one of those in the lobby 
on the way out. And if you'd like one in Spanish, those are in the orange cover. If you have one, then get one for someone else and you can give it to them. This Friday, we'll be having a mommy's meetup at Kids Kingdom Pecan Grove Park in Rowlett at 10 o'clock. And if you'd like to come to that, you can RSVP to Amy McBroom or find out more information about that from Amy. Her in, uh, information is in the bulletin. This Saturday, we'll be having a Titus II women's event that will be going over self-control here at the church at 9.30. Next Sunday evening from 6.30 to 9, there will be a high school fellowship at the Coburn's house. And so if you would like to come to that and you're a high school kid, make sure you RSVP to Rachel Coburn about that. There's no Trinity Women of the Word this week, but they will pick back up their study the following week on the doctrines of grace. April 10th, which is a Wednesday, we will be having a all church hymn night. So that's from seven to eight on April 10th, and you can come early for refreshments and fellowship. And then on April 28th, we will be having our second annual church picnic at Flagpole Hill, and that'll be from 12.30 to 4.30. That is the Sunday afternoon April 28th. Once again, Vacation Bible School will be the week of June 17th, and that will be from Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to noon for kids age 3 through 10. And if you'd like to come to that uh, as a volunteer or your kids to come to that, you can find information on how to RSVP on the website. And then to give you guys a brief update, there was a group of us that went to Ireland the past couple weeks, and we're able to partner with a couple churches over there, Hope Church in Nace, which is a small town outside of Dublin, and then also Emmanuel Baptist Church, which is Andrew Curry's church, which is in Lisburn, a small town outside of Belfast. And we had a great trip over there. We're able to be encouraged a lot by the brethren over there and then be encouraged by us, and we're able to serve alongside them in our partnership of the gospel. And so if you'd like to learn more about that trip and how you can be praying for those churches, we'll be having some sort of meeting uh, or way you can find out more information on that. We don't have it figured out just yet, but we will be doing something to give you a debrief on that trip. With that, we're going to stand and sing our first hymn, number 307, Christ Arose. Let's stand and sing.
our next song this morning, we're going to be singing number 312 in the hymnal, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Our last congregational song for this morning, we're going to be singing number 212 in the hymnal, Glorious Day.
may be seated. For this morning's, sorry, one sec. For this morning's choir special music, I know some of you got to hear this a little bit before the second service started, but they're going to be singing Oh God Beyond All Praising. It's an arrangement by David Schwobel. Would encourage you to follow along. There should be a pamphlet with the lyrics in the bulletin.
Well, that was tremendous. Uh, I feel like we're a real church, okay? Um, but let me just say this. We have entirely too many people here today. <laughs> so uh, everyone whose birthday is in February and November, please take next Sunday off. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. Well, I've got a great uh, text that we're going to look at today. And I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. For this being Easter Sunday, I'm going to step out of our study of the Gospel of Luke just for this one Sunday and speak to you on the resurrection. And the title of this message is The Gospel of the Resurrection. And as always, I want to begin by reading these verses. Now, I've Posted in social media, I would be going verses 1 through 8. I went to the elders' prayer meeting before the early service, and they all said there's no way I could do eight verses. So I said, well, actually, I'm going to go through 11. And they said, there's no way you're going to get to verse 11. So at the 8 o'clock service, I preached through verse 4. So (laughs) I'm a truth teller in church. So... um, I'm going to go ahead and read through verse 11, but I'll just tell you, I, I'm sure I can only get through verse 4, all right? So, you ready? Here we go. Paul writes, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also." For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me." This is the reading of God's inspired Word, a glorious text we have today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we humbly bow before Your throne of grace, and we remove the sandals from our feet and step onto the pages of this text of Scripture, knowing that the ground on which we stand is holy ground. We thank You that You had Paul record this for our benefit and for our good today. I pray that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, a heart to receive and to believe. Lord, we want you to impart this truth to us, and we want you to work it into the very fabric of our soul. So God, meet with us, draw near to us, as we draw near to you. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In these verses that I have just read, the Apostle Paul addresses the supreme importance of the gospel. And as a part of that, the absolute importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection really serves as the cornerstone upon which the cross rests. 
Without the resurrection, there is no gospel. Without the resurrection, Christ died in vain. Without the resurrection, our faith is in vain. Without the resurrection, we witness to others in vain. Without the resurrection, we live in vain. Without the resurrection, we die in vain. Without the resurrection, everything in life is vanity and empty and meaningless. That's how important the resurrection of Jesus Christ is from the dead. In reality, the resurrection of Jesus Christ validates the full sufficiency of the atonement of Jesus Christ. The cross is where you and I are saved. The resurrection is God's validation of the perfect sacrifice that was made by Jesus at the cross. In other words, the cross saves us and the resurrection makes it sure and certain. So, this passage is very instrumental in our Christian faith. It's not incidental, it's fundamental. It's a matter of first importance, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So, as we walk through this passage and depending upon how we allot our time, I have several headings I want to set in front of you that will be uh, footsteps through this text. And the first thing that I want you to see beginning in verse 1 is the preaching of the gospel. I mean, we see, see this in verses 1 and 2. The gospel is meant primarily to be preached. So he says in verse 1, now I make known to you brethren. The brethren are the believers in the city of Corinth. And Paul is saying to them, I want to make a full disclosure now to you of the most essential parts of the gospel. I make known to you, brethren, the gospel. Please note it's not a gospel as if it's one of many gospels. It's the gospel. It is the one and only gospel. And the word gospel is a word that is tossed around. I'm not certain that we always understand exactly what the word means. And I want to take a second just to clarify and define the word gospel. It's a compound word, which means two words joined together. It has a prefix, which means good, and the main root word means news or message or report. And when you put it together, the word gospel means good news. William Tyndale translated it first into the English language as glad tidings. It is the good news of salvation that God has provided in sending His Son into this world. It is the good news of forgiveness of sin that God offers to us. It is the good news of being clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And it is the good news that God's wrath toward us has been extinguished in the death of Christ upon the cross for all those who believe in Jesus Christ. You'll never hear better news than what I just said to you. You will never hear any news that is better news than the good news of salvation that is in Jesus Christ. And Paul then adds, which I preached to you. Please note the verb tense, I preached in the past, not I am preaching right now as I write this, but that I have already preached to you. And it reminds us that on Paul's second missionary journey, he went to the city of Corinth, and he came to Corinth in Acts chapter 18, and I'll just summarize it for you. And we read in Acts chapter 18, looking back when Paul first came and preached the gospel to them, he said he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. 
Paul began devoting himself completely to the Word. He, he was locked in on preaching the Word of God to them in Corinth and solemnly testifying. He wasn't entertaining them. He was solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. And so what was the response in Corinth to Paul's preaching of the gospel? Well, Luke records, they resisted and blasphemed. And so Paul shook out his garments and he said, your blood be on your hands. I am clean and is ready to leave town and to move on to the next city to preach the gospel. But that very night before Paul could leave town, Christ appeared to him in a vision. And Christ said to him, go on preaching here. I am with you. And then he said, for I have many people in this city. Well, no one has been saved yet. What do you mean, you have many people? Well, the answer is obvious, that there were those who were chosen by the Father for salvation before the foundation of the world. And Paul, you are to preach the Word of God, and then God by His sovereignty will summon to Himself those who have been elected by God before time began. And so, Paul preached the gospel, and God overcame the resistance in their hardened heart. They were, they were stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart, but God so worked the gospel into the fabric of their soul that they, their hearts were opened by the Holy Spirit, and they received the message of the Word. In fact, he goes on to say in verse 1, which also you received. They welcomed it by faith. Where they first stiff-armed it, they now have received it. And what made the difference? Well, they didn't change. It was God who made the difference. It was God who sovereignly called them out of darkness into relationship with Himself. And if you would just turn back to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2, I just want to draw this to your attention. I want you to see how it is that someone is converted to Christ and saved, and how it is that you were converted if, in fact, you are converted to Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2, we read about the call. He says, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now, watch this, saints by calling. They became saints because God pursued them and God summoned them, God apprehended them, God subpoenaed them, and God drew them to faith in Jesus Christ. They were running away from God, and God overcame them and called them to Himself. And whenever God calls someone, that immediately causes them to turn around and to call upon the name of the Lord. Uh, look at verse 2. He goes on to say that, saints by calling with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see the order there? There's a cause and effect. The cause is God calls us. The effect is we call upon the name of the Lord. The order is very important. Matthew, come follow me. He did. Zacchaeus, come down. I must dine with you tonight. He did. Lazarus, come forth. He did. When the Lord calls someone in that millisecond, they come to faith in Jesus Christ, and in that moment, they call upon the name of the Lord. You know why it is that you have called on the name of the Lord? It is because God has called you first. And He has called you by name. You didn't hear an audible voice. It was much louder than that. As God laid hold of you and brought you to Himself at the appointed time. All glory to God. Now look at verse 9 in, in chapter 1, verse 9. God is faithful 
Faithful to what? Faithful to bring about His eternal purpose and plan from before the foundation of the world. God is faithful to call all of His chosen ones to Himself in salvation. Look at verse 9. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship, that means a personal saving relationship, with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is not talking about being called to ministry, though we can find that from other verses. This is talking about being called not to service, but to salvation. No one will ever believe in Jesus Christ until they are first called. Everything begins with God, and everyone whom God calls will answer that call because His call is so powerful and so uh, uh, overpowering. That is why we don't have to use gospel gimmicks to get anyone saved. That's why we don't have to sing 48 verses of just as I am until someone will finally walk out of the balcony. We preach, God calls. And when God calls, that person who is called then calls upon the name of the Lord. That's the way it works. Now, 1 Corinthians 1, look at verse 24 as he continues to reinforce the call. In fact, look at verse 23. He says, we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. So, how in the world is anyone going to be saved? I stand up to preach, and for the Jews, it's nothing but a stumbling block. You want me to put my faith and trust in, in, in the Messiah, the supposed Messiah who was crucified and killed? No way. And then the Greeks, they want something profound. And the simplicity of the gospel, it, it wasn't deep enough for them. It wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't educated enough for them. So how are, how's any Greek going to be saved? How's any Jew going to be saved? How were you ever saved? It's the next verse, verse 24. But to those who are the called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. We stand up and preach, and it's foolishness to the world. In fact, in chapter 1, verse 18, right here, uh, he says, for the preaching of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. What is utterly foolish and what is a stumbling block would continue to be so except God calls, God summons, God brings, and God guarantees the success of the preaching of the Word of God. Think about it. It's a foolish method, preaching. It's a foolish message, Christ crucified. How's anyone ever going to be saved? God calls. Uh, look at verse uh, 26. For consider your calling, brethren. And he talks about who God chose to call. It's kind of the riffraff of society. For the most part, God reaches all the way to the bottom of the barrel to find those whom He will call to Himself with a few exceptions. This is the way it works, my friend. And so that's why he says in verse 30, by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Do you see that? Not by our doing, God and us. It's not by my doing, just me. No, it's God and God alone. By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. So, come back to 1 Corinthians 15 now. And it helps us understand the background for how it is that they received the gospel from Paul when they initially put up roadblocks and they initially stiff-armed the message. How, how did Paul get through to them? It wasn't Paul. It was God. And God called them, and they received the message. And please notice this, in which you Stand. 
Everyone who receives the gospel stands firmly in the gospel for the rest of their lives. No one ever receives the gospel and then falls away from the gospel. No one ever receives the gospel and then goes in a different direction. No believer will ever become an unbeliever because everyone who receives the gospel, they, they are anchored in the gospel, they are planted in the gospel, they are rooted and grounded in the gospel, God nails their feet to the floor, and they cannot move away. Uh, there may be times of weakness. There, there, there may be times of a little taking your eye off of the Lord and being enamored for a season with worldly things, but you continue to stand in the gospel. That's what Paul is reminding them. That's how powerful the gospel is. Now, notice verse 2. That, that we need to talk about this. He says, by which you are saved. Now, first of all, and I've said this many times, but let me say it again. The word saved, it's a good Bible word, by the way. It means you are rescued from great peril. It means you are delivered from great danger that you were in the line of fire, and that fire was the wrath of God, and God saved you, really, from Himself, by Himself, for Himself. Paul says, you are saved. Now, Salvation, please note the verb tense here too. It's in the present tense. You are saved, okay? When you, we open up the lens and we take in the whole Bible, salvation really comes in three verb tenses, if you will. Past tense, present tense, future tense. If we get our arms all the way around salvation... We were saved in the past at the time of our conversion. We were saved from the penalty of sin. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But now we are being saved from the practice of sin. This is known as sanctification. We were saved conversion. We are being saved, sanctification for the rest of our lives. Uh, Philippians 1 verse 6, he who began a good work and you shall perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And we are being conformed more and more day by day into the very image of Jesus Christ. We are being saved from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, we do not become sinless, but we do sin less. And we are growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then one day in the future tense, we will be saved from the very presence of sin. That's glorification. So, we have been saved from the penalty of sin. I am being saved. You are being saved from the practice of sin. And one glorious day in the future, we will be saved from the very presence of sin. So, what is Paul saying here? By which you are saved. He is stressing that everyone who is converted to Christ will be living a distinctly different life with different priorities and different commitments and different loves. We are being saved from what we once were. That's what Paul is underscoring here. And let me just add this footnote. No one who has ever been saved 
will not be being saved. Everyone who is converted to Christ will be progressively being sanctified and becoming like Christ. That, that's what God's doing in your life, and it, it's a lifelong process, but here Paul is underscoring the fact that God is saving them right now, even after their conversion, He is saving them from a worldly lifestyle. He's saving them from, a, from fleshly pursuits. He, he's saving them from being ensnared by the works of the devil. God is at work saving us right now. He's saving you. And one day, He will save you in His very presence from any presence of sin. So notice what he says next at the end of verse 2, and now you see why I only preach the first four verses. Um, this, is, this is just good. This is good truth. If, so in other words, he, he is saying, you can know that you are being saved and have been saved if you hold fast the Word. That is evidence that you are a true believer in Jesus Christ, that, that you are holding fast the Word of God. You will not let go of the Word of God. You will not cave in to the philosophies of this secular society. You will not imbibe the, the wisdom of this world. You, you will not take in the devil's lies. No, as a true believer, you will hold fast the Word. That is the evidence of your salvation. It is the evidence that God is in your life. It, it is the evidence that, that you belong to the Lord, that you hold fast to His Word. And then Paul says at the end of verse 2, which I preach to you, circling back to what he said in verse 1, now listen to this, unless, unless, and it'll be true of some here today, you have believed in vain. The word vain here means empty, fruitless. It's what we would call a non-saving faith. In other words, you have truth in your head, but it does not affect the priorities of your life, and it does not affect how you live and where you go and how you speak and, and how you serve, you have believed in vain. In other words, it is possible to profess Christ with the mouth, but not possess Christ in the heart. Do you get the difference? And it's been well said, many people will miss heaven by 18 inches the distance from their head to their heart. If it's in the head but not in the heart, you have believed in vain. It's a, you had a counterfeit conversion. You have a bogus belief. You have a faulty faith. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. I wonder if that could be true of you. Because it's possible to be in church on Easter morning, but to believe in vain because it has never taken root in your heart and in your soul, and it has therefore never produced the fruit of a changed and transformed life. That's what Paul is having to warn against here. Now, before I go on, I, I do want to make this point of application from verses 1 and 2, that the stronger the preaching of the Word you sit under, the stronger will be your standing on the truth and in the Word. You need the Word brought to you 
in a strong, straightforward, spirit-filled, scriptural manner to tighten the bolts week by week in your faith so that you are firmly anchored in the truth of God's Word. And then also we learn from this that the stronger the preaching of the Word of God that you sit under, you are more likely to be being saved from the practice of sin. Weak preaching produces weak Christians at best. Weak preaching produces counterfeit Christians. Strong preaching has a way of separating the wheat from the tares, and it enables you to those who are truly the Lord's to walk with the Lord. You want strong preaching so you can be strong in your faith in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is saying to the church at Corinth, and that is what I'm saying to you today. Now, let's move on to verse 3. The second thing I want you to see is the priority of the gospel. The priority of the gospel, and at the first part of verse 3, Paul says, for I delivered to you. The word delivered means I handed over to you. Uh, I, I, I brought it to you. I, I Here, I proclaimed and preached it to you, please note this, as of first importance, as of first importance, that which you received. First importance is one word in the original Greek language when Paul wrote this, and it means to be of primary importance, to be of utmost importance. Now, let me clarify. Everything that Paul wrote in the New Testament, 13 epistles, is absolutely true. Every jot, every tittle, every verb tense, every sentence structure, it's all true. All unadulterated, as R.C. Sproul would say, unvarnished truth. And every sermon that Paul preached as an apostle was true. However, some things that he said were more important than other things. For example, what he said in chapter 11 about women wearing head coverings to the public worship service. It's not as important. It's important, but it's not as important as what he's saying right here. This is of first importance the gospel of Jesus Christ. And why is the gospel of first importance? Because you cannot go to heaven apart from the gospel. And you cannot be right with God apart from the gospel. Uh, you cannot be wrong about the gospel and be right with God. It's non-negotiable. You can be wrong about forms of church government in the church, church government, and still go to heaven, whether it's an elder-led, congregation-led, pastor-led, some hybrid between that. That's, you can believe what you want to believe. I believe what the Scripture teaches, but um, you can still go to heaven. You can be wrong about mode of baptism. Do you immerse? Do you sprinkle? Do you pour? You still go to heaven. You can be wrong about certain aspects of the second coming of Christ and the, the timeline of events and still go to heaven. Here's the deal. You can be wrong about the second coming the tribulation, the Antichrist, 666, on and on, and still go to heaven, but you cannot be wrong about the first coming of Christ and go to heaven. You cannot be wrong about what we're about to look at here in the next, in the next main heading about the essential component parts of the gospel and still go to heaven, you deny these essential parts that are in the second half of verse 3 and verse 4, and you'll never go to heaven. 
except to stand at the great white throne judgment and to be condemned and then damned. So let's look now, third main heading, the particulars of the gospel. Starting in the middle of verse 3 and extending to verse 4, Paul tells us there are three essential parts of the gospel. This is a minimalist understanding of the gospel, and what we see at the end of verse 3 and in verse 4, it all involves the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is about Jesus Christ. Your testimony is not the gospel. Your testimony is about you. The gospel is about Jesus. Your testimony is how you have come to know Jesus, but Jesus is the gospel. The gospel, the good news of salvation, it is found in the person and work of Jesus Christ. He is the alpha and the omega of the gospel, the beginning and the end, the sum and the substance of the gospel. And this is exactly what we see Paul zeroing in here, these three component parts. Please take this in and have this at the forefront of your mind, at the forefront of your heart, on the tip of your tongue as God gives you opportunity to tell others about Jesus Christ, here are the three mountain peaks. Number one, Christ was crucified. That's what he says in verse 3, that Christ died, which means he was nailed to a cross and put to death for. This little preposition for is the little key that opens the big door into the vault of heaven. The word for here means on behalf of, in the place of, in the stead of. Christ died not for himself. He was sinless, but he became sin for us so that he could die for us. That should have been you and me nailed to that cross. But Jesus died for, this says, our sins. Our referring to believers, sins referring to missing the mark. It was a substitutionary death. There are many theologians who would say to reduce the cross down to just one word. It is the word substitution. That Jesus died a vicarious death in our place upon the cross. 1 Peter 3, 18 puts it this way, that he died the just for the unjust, the holy one for the unholy ones. That's what the cross, that is what the gospel is all about. Now, what did he accomplish when he died upon the cross? What, what, what was the effect of that death upon the cross? I want to give you five words that, I'm going to do it quickly, that, that succinctly summarize what Christ accomplished on the cross. Number one is the word propitiation. That's a good Bible word. Romans 3, 1 John 2, 1 John 4, propitiation. What does that mean? It means appeasement satisfaction. In Jesus' death upon the cross, He placated the wrath of God toward you. The Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. And the Bible says that we were under the wrath of God. In fact, we were children of wrath. And God's anger and vengeance and fury was upon us. And in the death of Christ, Jesus extinguished the fiery vengeance of God's wrath toward us who believe. Propitiation. 
Second word is redemption. That when Jesus died upon the cross, He shed His blood, He gave His life a ransom for many, and He paid the penalty for our sins. And the wages of sin is death, not just physical death, but eternal death and eternal separation from God. Jesus, by His death upon the cross, He paid the ransom price to deliver us out of the slave market of sin and, and Satan and has set us free. If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. John eight thirty two. The third word is reconciliation. Jesus, upon the cross, in His death, stood between two offended parties who were at enmity with one another, and Jesus became the peacemaker. He became the mediator between holy God and sinful man, and He made reconciliation, and He brought the two parties together that they would now be one. That's what He did in His death upon the cross. You and I could never be accepted by God in heaven was it, if it was not for the shed blood of Christ and His death. Reconciliation. The fourth word is expiation, which means that our sins were lifted off of us and placed upon an innocent sacrifice, the Lamb of God. And He has taken our sins far away from us because they were taken off of us and placed onto Him. How far? Psalm 103 says that He has removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. He's buried them in the sea of His forgetfulness. He's placed them behind His back. He can see them no more. That's expiation. The fifth word is sanctification. And in the death of Christ, Jesus dying in our place, by that death upon the cross, Jesus crushed the power of sin that once dominated your life and governed your life and ruled your life, that temper, that tongue that fleshly desire, all of that was controlling your life. Yes, it was. But in the death of Christ, He died such a death that sin no longer is master over you. It's still in your flesh, but it's no longer master over you. You have a new master. You're under new management. You have a new Lord, Jesus Christ. And He is the ruler of your life, not sin, Christ. It was accomplished at the cross. And I'm going to give you a sixth word, okay? Justification. Jesus, in His sin, sinless life and substitutionary death, He obeyed the law of God and the will of God perfectly on your behalf. And it is His perfect, sinless life that fulfilled all righteousness that is credited to your account as if you have lived a sinless and perfect life. I don't think I've ever lived five minutes sinless and perfect. I doubt you have. Jesus lived a perfect life for the entirety of His life, and the, the last step of that life was He yielded to the will of the Father at the cross, and He laid down His life a ransom for many. It's that perfect life that is now charged to your account. And it is consummated in the death of Christ. You now are clothed with the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. He cannot see 
the sin in your life in a legal, judicial way, he only sees the perfect righteousness of God's Son. All that took place at the cross and more. But I need to let you out before Mother's Day. So, um, and he says in verse 3, at the end of verse 3, according to the Scriptures, why does he add that? It is to let us know this is not a new way of salvation, that it was recorded long ago in the Old Testament Scripture. It has been written and recorded in the Old Testament. What are some of those passages, if we had time to turn to them? Uh, obviously, Isaiah 53. Uh, obviously, Psalm 22. Uh, obviously, Genesis 3, verse 15. Uh, we could go to many other passages of Scripture to show the sin-bearing substitutionary death of Christ upon the cross. Now, what this means is, th this is, I, I need to say this. There, there are some well-meaning people who, when they read their Bible or have heard certain preachers, they assume this, that there was one way to be saved in the Old Testament, one way for a Jew to be saved in the Old Testament, that you had to keep the law of God and you had to go to the temple and you had to have sacrifices offered for you and you, you had to live a moral life in order to be saved. And then when we come to the New Testament, now there's a, a Jesus has come, and so now we must believe upon Christ and be saved. And so what we would have under that false uh, dichotomy is that there are two ways of salvation. One way to be saved in the Old Testament for a Jew, another way to be saved in the New Testament for a Gentile. That's heresy. There's only one way of salvation. There's only one Savior. There's only one problem that we all have. It is sin, and there's only one solution, and it is Christ. Understand this. We are saved. Anyone who's ever been saved has been saved by these three prepositional phrases, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Sola gratia, sola fide, solus Christos. And so when Paul says Christ was crucified according to the Scriptures, he's pointing back to the Old Testament. It was all foretold there. Now, in verse 4, he comes to the second main truth component part of the gospel, and he says Christ was buried. First he was crucified, then he was buried, and we ask the question, we see it at the beginning of verse 4, and that he was buried. What does that have to do with the gospel? A lot of people are buried. What does that have to do? Well, the answer is that it validates that Jesus really died upon the cross. They buried him. He, he, he didn't go unconscious. He, he didn't swoon into an unconscious state, and then three days later, he came out of the coma. No, he actually died. And he had to die because the Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. If we are to have our sins for, removed, then someone's going to have to die for those sins. It's either me or Christ. And so the burial is very important, and it validates the reality of his death. And then it says Christ was raised, and that He was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. And I don't have time to walk us through the Old Testament, but I'm going to take us to one passage, okay? Only if you'll come go with me, all right? So turn back to Isaiah 53, and there is one verse, it's a large verse, it's an important verse, but Isaiah 53 and verse 10, as you well know, Isaiah 53 is the, it's the Mount Everest of the Old Testament concerning the death of Christ upon the cross. It's, it's here in the previous verses 
uh, that he says, like in verse 4, our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried. Um, he was, verse 5, he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Uh, verse 6, all of us like sheep have gone astray, each has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. It's all about the substitutionary death of Christ, but without the resurrection of Christ, the death of Christ is meaningless. So there has to be the resurrection to accompany the crucifixion. So look at verse 10. May the Lord give you eyes to see. But the Lord, that's God the Father, was pleased. He was not reluctant. He was pleased to crush him. Him refers to God the Son. And the word crush means to wield a fatal blow unto death. God the Father brought down the full fury of His vengeance upon His Son and crushed Him to death. Who put Jesus to death? In a secondary way, it was the Roman soldiers. In a secondary way, it was Pilate. In a secondary day, it was the crowd there that cried out, crucify Him, crucify Him. That, that's all secondary. One primary agent, it is God the Father who worked through the instrumentality of, of these secondary agents, but behind the, it all, it was God the Father who crushed the life out of His Son upon that cross. Now, continue to read in verse 10. If He, the Son, God the Son, would render Himself, offer Himself as a guilt offering, as a sacrifice for sin, He, the Son, now watch this, will see His offspring. There will be children born into a family who will be the result of Him rendering Himself as a guilt offering the offspring here are those who are born again, those who are adopted into God's family, those who are seated in this room down through the centuries. Continue. He, God the Father, will prolong, extend His days. The days of His Son, God the Father, will prolong His days. Wait a minute. I thought you put Him to death. I thought you crushed Him. You did. And now you will prolong His days? What does that mean? That means you will raise Him from the dead. You will bring Him back from the grave. And when you bring Him back from the grave, down through the centuries as the gospel is preached, He will live to see His offspring. And at the end of verse 10, and the good pleasure of the Lord. That's how this verse began, but the Lord was pleased to crush him. Now it ends at the end of 10, and the good pleasure of the Lord, that's God the Father, will prosper, will succeed. It will look like he's defeated. It will look like Satan won. It will look like the Romans have conquered. It will look like the majority of the Jews have, have, have won the day. They've put the Messiah down. No, the Lord will prosper in His hand. God the Father will cause God the Son to prosper because He laid, a, laid down His life a ransom for many. And these offspring, as I have said, are seated in this room. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I can tell you Christ died for you. And the Father has called you out of darkness and out of the world into fellowship with His Son, and you know God, and you walk with Christ. And it is at the very heart of this gospel message is the resurrection. 
Christ was crucified for us. He was buried for us. He was raised for us. And that is the heart and the heartbeat of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So as I bring this to conclusion, has the risen Christ changed your life? Have you personally met the resurrected Christ? Does He live within you? Has He taken away your sins? Has He paid off in full your sin debt? Has He reconciled you to God? Has God's wrath been turned away from you? If not, then turn to Christ this very moment, this very day. You may never hear the gospel presented so plainly and so simply to you as you have just heard it. You may have never have another opportunity like this to have the gospel ringing in your ears and for the gospel to be so near to you. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. That tells us there are times when God is near and there are times when he is not so near. And he is always near when his gospel is preached. And so I call you today to believe in Jesus Christ, to commit your life to the risen Christ. He's your only hope. He is your only Savior. He is your only way to the Father. Turn to him. Trust him. Commit your life to him. And He will gather you in, and he, he will save you. If you have already done this, then rejoice that you are as certain for heaven this moment as though you have already been there 10,000 years. This is good news. You'll never hear any news any better than what you have heard today. Others can preach the gospel better than me. But no one can preach a better gospel than me. You have heard the greatest news ever to be proclaimed on the face of the earth. You need to own it. You need to possess it. You need to receive it. You need to make it your gospel. Let us pray. Father in heaven, how we thank you for your grace and your mercy that you have lavished upon us, you have opened up the windows of heaven and poured out a deluge of forgiveness and grace upon us, we who are so undeserving. We thank you for the way you have dealt with us so kindly, so patiently, with so much mercy and such compassion. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I have a great closing benediction. Now to him, referring to God the Father, who is able to do, listen to this, far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. I will see you next Lord's Day.